uh, uh, before I, I introduce you to my colleagues and go through this slide, I just want to quickly introduce myself. I'm Nicole Givens. I am the host procurement administrator here. And today, myself and my colleagues are going to present just um, an overview of our whole contracting process from start to finish, share a little bit about host, and then at the end, have time for some Q&A. So quickly, just want to remind folks and, and share with folks, host was a new department that was formed by Mayor Hancock. Um, it was signed under an executive order on October 23rd, 2019, and we work to keep Denver healthy, housed, and connected. So we invest resources to create these policies and work with our partners um, to provide housing stability resources, resolve episodes of homelessness, and create housing opportunities. So we have um, particular pillars, and all of this information is in our five-year strategic plan, uh, but we work with a, an equity lens. So all of our programs are trauma-informed, data-driven, and person-centered. Uh, we have our homeless resolution team, our housing stability team, and our housing opportunity team, as well as our operation teams. So to start um, at the very, very beginning is really a lot of planning that goes into our programs. So we determine our contract needs, determine the budget and resources and obtain that community input. The second, second stage of creating that whole contract process is the procurement. Uh, so determining the schedules and drafting guidelines, drafting those documents themselves. Stage three is the solicitation announcement. So announce the contract needs. Um, we put all of our opportunities on the city website and as well as ZenGen. We host uh, pre-bid conferences, and that is an opportunity really for anyone who might be interested in applying to ask questions, gain clarification about those requirements um, and what we envision in those programs. Stage four is the evaluation. There's a, two parts to it. There's a technical evaluation. Um, there's specific documents that we just require as a part of the procurement. And so there's kind of like a checklist to make sure that everything was responded to, answered, and we have the correct documents. And then there's an evaluation set by an evaluation team, and they review the proposals and um, score appropriately. Next slide. So stage five are the award recommendations. Once the evaluation team has gone through all the proposals and they come together, present their recommendations, um, they send it to leadership. And then eventually notice of successful proposal letters are sent out. Stage six is really that development and execution. So once you're awarded a contract, right? working with our programs team, working with the CA or our contract administrators to create uh, that scope of work as well as finalize the budgets and then get through all of the, the JAGA processes as well as our city council approvals if needed. Stage seven is really an ongoing thing throughout the life of the contract, which is the monitoring and compliance. Uh, we our goal is to we aim to have strong partnerships, and so a lot of it is about doing reporting on measurements and outcomes, and looking for best practices and way to strengthen those relationships. And then stage eight, which is the final part of our contract process, uh, either renewals or closeouts. That all depends really on funding streams, amendments as well as um, that monitoring and compliance, All right? So there are, like I said, many points of contact um, while you're working as our partners. There's a contract administrator, a program officer, 
the accounting team as well as our data team. Um, but you will usually interact with these three in particular throughout that life cycle. So I will hand it over to Rashonda. Thanks, Nicole. Um, hello, my name is Rashonda and I'm one of the um, contract administrators um, here at HOST. And the HOST contracting team consists of four contract administrators, a monitor and performance evaluation officer, and a procurement contract administrator. Contract administrators assist with negotiating contract terms, the scope of services, and budgets, ensuring effective use of city resources to drive outcomes that address Denver's housing dis, uh, stability needs. Depending on the funding source and service descriptions determines the team's um, assigned contracts. Um, can you, oh, I was gonna say, can you move to the next slide, please? I'm sorry. The number one goal as a contract administrator is to promptly move all contracts through Jagger, the city's contracting system, creating a fully executed contract. Contract administrators act, act as a liaison to the city attorney's office and follow prospective contracts throughout the review process. In addition, contract administrators provide technical guidance to staff and partners, recommend and coordinate the implementation of policies and procedures for assigned functions. Um, if you have any questions pertaining to the contract budget or development or the language in the scope, um, then we're what the contract administrators would be the person that you would reach out to. After sp um, briefly speaking about the role of the contract administrator, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Dave Riggs. He will talk about the role of a program officer here at HOST. Thanks, Rashonda. Uh, like Rashonda just said, my name is Dave Riggs. I'm a program officer. Specifically, I'm on the homelessness resolution team, and I've been with the city for almost five years doing this kind of work. Um, Katie, could you go back a slide, actually? And the I'm trying to differentiate the program officer role from the CA role that Rashonda was just talking about, because I think from the perspective of our partners, sometimes they get a little muddled, and that's it's totally OK. But the way I think about it is the program officer is with you throughout the program year, throughout your contract, and through the amendment process and anything like that. I think of the CAs as kind of like almost internal consultants, sort of. They pop in and out uh, as needed. So they might be around for the very beginning. You might be working with them a whole lot right then and getting things set up. But the program officer you're going to be meeting with at least quarterly, as we'll talk about in a minute here, um, and helping you throughout the whole term of your contract. So I like to think of it as you're kind of wed to your program officer through your contract. And this is a joyous wedding. This is not a sad wedding. So it's a good thing. Um, and the program officer will get to know your program. You'll get to know the PO and lots of shared information back and forth and knowledge sharing all around. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Star. Thank you. You can move to the next slide now, Katie. Oops. Um, my name's Star. I'm with the accounting account payable team. We are the ones that will process your invoices and get you paid for the work that you're doing so greatly for us. Um, we work closely with the PO throughout the contract, like David was explaining. Um, we process the invoices for reimbursement. We focus on the required documentation that was written within that contract. Um, so if we have questions or you have questions, you can always feel free to reach out directly to the host AP box. Um, we will work closely with your program officer, or you can just reach out directly with them and they'll reach out to us if it needs to be. Um, so that is who I am. I'm gonna pass it back to Dave for more details. Thanks, Star. Uh, Katie, if you could go one more ahead. Thank you. So uh, you got to meet a little bit of the staff here and learn about those different roles a bit. We're switching gears now to talk about some of the monitoring and auditing and all of those good things that you get as part of your city contract as well. So um, this slide is just kind of talking about high level, the different parts of it. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, Katie, I'll talk more in depth about one of them. 
Yep. So the, the program officer is responsible for this one, the program site visits. And I kind of mentioned quarterly check-ins earlier. So that's what this is really. So the program officer will work with you if you need technical assistance, like say, for instance, you uh, have a new HUD funded program grant and you are not so familiar with it, but you obviously have the expertise to work on that. So the the TA may come through your program officer partially, they, or they might be able to help you find the right information from HUD. So that's a great example of how you could learn about the program that you're starting on through partnership with your PO. Um, they're going to be checking in with you quarterly. That's what this visit is about, to make sure everything is on track. So when you have your contract and you go through it, there's all those very detailed outcomes, outputs, metrics, whatever you would like to call them. That is some of the information the program officer is going to check in with you on a very detailed level, probably each quarter to make sure things are on track and to course correct as needed. Um, and like I said before, we are learning as we go and we are sharing that information with our whole network of others. It happens all the time where we want to learn something from one program, like a rapid rehousing program, and we can share that with another program who has been struggling in that area. So uh, wonderful networking and shared information there to make all the programs better across the projects. And I'm going to pass it back, I think, to Rashonda. Yes. The next slide, Katie. Thank you. I'm going to speak um, briefly about um, contract monitoring. The monitoring performance evaluation officer performs annual on-site investigation and file review to verify compliance with contract requirements, including projected outcome requirements, contract spending milestones, and making sure contractors comply with federal and local rules and regulations. The monitoring officer works closely with host partners to develop and maintain a tracking system of contracting monitored monitoring files through the term of the contract, archive all resource documents, and complete reports for management on performance. In addition, contract monitoring provides an opportunity to build community partner relationships, address contract concerns, and share best practices. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Star. Um, she will speak on the last phase of monitoring, which is financial monitoring. Thank you. So as a high overview in general, we do a once a year audit where we will request um, either in person or request additional documentation. Um, this just making sure that you're in compliance with the, the federal and state rules of the uh, award grants. But we also do every invoice is monitored for in compliance. So that kind of helps us all stay on track throughout the whole year. If you want to go to the next slide. This is where the fun begins with being paid. Um, the expense certification form is sent out when we execute the contract. We do this to help kind of keep in balance the budget and make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, there's a few form, uh, spots that are required that need to make sure we're addressed. So the areas in red on the top, we do need the date of the actual submission, not the date of the end of the period. Um, that will be down below. But then we also need an invoice number. The invoice number does need to be a unique number. Um, because in our system, if you have multiple contracts with us or multiple grants, we can't use the same number twice. So if it is for an ESG grant and you also have maybe a TRUA grant, you want to maybe just add the acronym onto the invoice number um, along with the date just to make it unique so that it's not going to repeat any other year. Um, the purchase order is given to you by the, the CA when they send over this wonderful welcome packet to you. Um, should it change at any time, we'll let you know. Usually it will be either the program officer or 
the AP team. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, I think we get a little more in depth. Yes. So again, it's just the parts and areas so we can see a little bit better. <laughs> we The city contract number will always remain the same. Um, if you need to add the amendment numbers on there, just make sure you have that main contract number um, that links us back to your supplier contract number. Um, this is your contract terms. Those will be posted. We run, in the city, we run on a calendar year. So if your contract is during a calendar year, you'll want to put your contract terms as the calendar year. Um, your draw period, this is where you'll put your draw period and your draw ending period, uh, not the date on submission. And then you'll put your code, a description. Um, if it's ESG, just write ESG. If it's a voucher writing program, write voucher writing program, just so that we know um, which actual program you're talking, because I know most of you have multiple programs with us. Next page. This one is the fun one that us accountants love, and I'm sure the rest of you do not, but this is your budgeted amount. So this is the amount that you are awarded. Uh, your current draw is what you're currently asking for. That will be updated per every month that you're submitting your invoice. Your total prior draws would be, say we're in July, so your first, if you had a your year, you first six months would be in your total prior draws, plus your current draw, and then this would be your remaining balance that is of the budget. Um, these all need to match because we're tracking this, so sometimes we will send them back and ask you for an updated should we have to adjust large amounts, or we'll send you an email and say, hey, we had to deny a cost. Make sure that your next month is balanced. Um, because we wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. Again, this is a learning curve for all of us. Um, so be patient <laughs> with us because um, sometimes we won't catch it right away. Next slide. Um, supporting documentation. This is always the fun one. For rental assistance um, or direct client assistance, we need, well, it's kind of, different. For rental assistance, if you are approving somebody for rental assistance, um, an approval letter stating the amount and the times that we're paying for is acceptable. We also need proof of payment for that assistance. Same with direct client assistance. If you're taking them to Goodwill to get a work outfit, we need that detailed receipt. Um, general guidelines, for salary and fringe, we love payroll journals. Payroll journals are our friend and they're not so many pages. Um, we just need it for the people you are re requesting reimbursement for. Professional services, traveling, training, program supplies, all those just need a detailed receipt showing that you um, purchased it and you paid for it. Um, next slide. Here's an example of like summary sheets because we are asking for so much documentation um, and each invoice is a standalone invoice. It's just easier to make sure we have everything in one place and we're not trying to piece together a bunch of things when we're auditing or when we're trying to track. Um, summary pages, I know a lot of you use uh, general template that we use just need that the gross wages and the percent of the hours worked so that you're billing towards the program. If they're 100 percent, hey, easy peasy. If they're not and they have split percentages, um, this little cheater sheet we have out there, we can share it with you, makes it a whole lot easier to kind of calculate everything. Same with your expenses we do like a summary of your expenses so that we can go through and match receipts to the expenses you are requesting reimbursement for next page again with all of these it's we want to know what you're paying for um, that you paid for it 
and the details behind it. Same with professional services. A lot of times if you're going to do uh, consult work or have a subcontractor, you reach out to your program officer. They'll ask for a lot more details than what we want. We want just the cover page that says, I paid for these services, I ordered it, and I have approval. Um, again, it's just kind of like balancing that book. You send your kid out with 20 bucks, you want to know where they spent that $20 um, and that they just didn't pay it to their friend to go do their yard work. Um, next slide. That is the end of me. So I'm handing it back to Dave. Hey, thanks, Star. Um, so the budget, of course, is very important. And we try and work with you in the contracting process to get that as absolutely right as possible. We do understand that things happen and things change and there's global pandemics and things like that. So we can't always anticipate how the budget needs might change throughout the contract. So there are a couple of different ways that we can make changes to that. Um, we do a couple of points to note. So firstly, we do not do either of these within the first 30 days of your program year. So as mentioned earlier, most contracts are on like a calendar year, but there are quite a few that are also not, that are exceptions to that. So your year, whatever that is, your program year, we don't do these within the first 30 days. We also don't do these within the last 90 days as well. Uh, also, you can do two a year. That is total. That's not two modifications and two amendments. It could be one of each or two of one or the other. Uh, I hope that makes sense. So to talk about these just a tiny bit, and we can always talk more, you can talk with your program officer at any time, but the modification is a little more gentler version, let's say, and you can make changes to specific line items. You can move funds between line items with that. And all of this is a request, I should say. And then the program officer and somebody from our finance team and a CA will all go over it and review your request to see if it works within the scope of the budget and the goal of the contract and all that to make sure it's the work that we are hiring you to do basically. Um, the modification version does not make changes to the whole scope of work. So you can't change the focus of the work or even activities of the work. Um, and like I said, it requires those different approvals. The amendment is the very significant version, let's say. So if your contract is over $500,000 and it went through city council before, it has to go through that whole process again for the contract amendment. Uh, this is also where funds can get added or taken from a contract. Both of those things do happen. Um, and if, say, a contract was for $400,000 and another $100,000 or $150,000, let's say, is added to it, then that's going to meet that $500,000 threshold, and it will have to go through the city council process as an amendment, even though it didn't have to the first time. So the amendment process is where bigger changes can be made, uh, line items can be added, there could be changes to a contract term, dollars can get added or taken away, like I mentioned and scope can even change in this as well. Um, and all of this, I just want to encourage you to talk early and often with your program officer, and they can help guide you through the process and help you figure out which one of these lanes is correct for you, and they can help you with your request to do this. I am going to pass over to Catherine on our data team. Thanks, Dave. I'm Catherine O'Connor. I'm an analyst with the host data strategy and policy team. And um, I know this is a lot of information, so I will keep this brief, but you can always contact us if you have questions. So um, main question is why does host require reporting? Um, a lot of it is related to our funding streams, but in addition to that, we want to be able to track information on participants um, served so that we can understand where we are in terms of equity and delivery of services. Um, it gives us a strong foundation for making decisions that are based on data rather than just anecdotal evidence. Um, although we do really 
value the information that you give us in the narrative section of the report and the explanations um, of what's working and what's not. Like Dave said, that helps us get an understanding of like where are the successes, what are new innovations that are working well, and we can share that information with other program providers. Um, it helps us support transparency and accountability with the community. So we have several reports and dashboards that we put out to the public and that tells them how we're doing in relation to um, what our goals are. It's just aggregated metrics. So we're not getting information about any individuals that are served through any of those reports. Um, and as you may be familiar with, we have two primary systems where we collect data. One is Salesforce, also known as the host programs community, and the other is the homeless management information system that's only used by homelessness resolution providers. Um, and a few of them do not use that if they have um, protected populations such as domestic violence victims. Next slide, please. So for data and reporting on programs um, that you're contracted to do, um, once contractors have executed, done all the signatures and the contract is executed, um, you'll identify to us who would be doing the reporting and the host data team will provide you with login credentials um, for the host programs community, as well as training on HMIS if that is needed. Um, we have various job aids and um, user manuals for that sort of thing, and they'll be provided to you as well. And you can always reach us if you have questions. Um, we're glad to help out. And our email is postprograms.denver.gov.org. Um, and I'm going to kick it back to Nicole. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. All right, Katie, next slide. All right, so close out. Um, when a contract is complete, there's the cold closeout process. So completed financial, uh, final accounting is required for all contracts at the end of the contract period. And all of that includes everything that's listed here. So submission of outstanding vouchers for reimbursement, identification, and disposition of all non-expendable property purchased with those funds. Uh, if, if that applies to your program, obviously, reconciliation of customer records, reconciliation and closure of all financial records, um, disposal of any and all unclaimed checks, and programmatic review and evaluation and preparation of the final contract reimbursement. All right. So the contract closeout procedures and forms are delivered um, to the contractor by the monitoring and performance evaluation officer, and they are to be completed and returned no later than 45 days after the close of that contract. Um, so submission of that closeout report does not absolve any contractor of those responsibilities that are required for any audit exceptions regarding their contract which might be later identified. And now to the best part, questions. So um, you guys, I, I think I don't see any questions in the question answer, but folks, I believe Katie, you gave them the option to also unmute. Yeah. Uh, if anybody would like to ask a question, you can, um, and you should be able to, oh, I see we have a raised hand. Um, go ahead and ask your question. Um, Barb. I think it might be the one in the chat about it yes. being recorded. Yes, these are, uh, it will be recorded and uh, we will be posting it to our host website um, for the contractor resources page. Thank you for your question. And you, we throw through a lot out. It's a long process, but if if there's any particular 
questions about, you know, program officers and their quarterly um, monitoring or about finance or questions about procurement processes, data. You can always email host AP um, if you have finance questions. If we can't answer them, we'll get with our partners. No questions? I have a quick question. This is Christy Lintzner at St. Francis Center. Yes. So we, if you're on a calendar year um, contract, when is the last month you can do a budget modification? So if you're running from January to December. Yes. What's the latest date I have to do a budget modification? That's September, right, Dave? Yes, before the last quarter. So okay. before, before the, the last, last quarter starts. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. I have a quick question. Um, it's just for um, allowable spending. Um, we would reach out to our program officer in that case if we had questions about that. I think that's a great place to start. Yeah, I mean, that's my default answer for everything. My PO colleagues are probably mad at me right now, but um, I don't care and encourage you to reach out to your program officer all the time. Um, and that's a great place to start to understand what is allowable in your budget. And if they have questions, they will pull in other colleagues for sure. We support you in that answer, Dave. All right, if there aren't any other questions, I'm happy to um, give time back in the day. We just wanted to make sure that there was available time to, to answer any, any questions. If not, thank you guys all for your time and please feel free if you do think of questions later on to reach out. Um, Dave first, just reach out to him. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> we're all here for any His questions. His personal really. phone number is. No, just <laughs> oh, but yes, please feel free to reach out at any time. Uh, we host strongly does uh, believe in supporting our partners. So thank you all for the services that you provide. And thanks for your time today. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.